Hi, this is Larry Huppen. I am a medical consultant at ProLab Orthotics, and today we are going to look at orthotic therapy prescription writing for Halix Limitus. Our goals here are to first review the underlying causes of functional hallux limitus, and then we're going to look at three articles, three studies that are related to mechanical treatment of functional hallux limitus, and use the results of those studies in trying to write a prescription for patients with hallux limitus that will do the best job of decompressing the first metatarsal phalangeal joint and subsequently give that patient the best potential clinical outcome. So let's first uh, do a quick review of the definition of functional hallux limitus, and this is from a uh, 2006 article by Scheer that we will be talking about in a few minutes. Uh, uh, to define it, it is greater than 50 degrees of dorsiflexion non-weight bearing and less than 14 degrees of dorsiflexion in stance and with no evidence of trauma or arthritis. It's associated with deformities of hallux rigidus or hallux valgus in that over time, functional hallux limitus can lead to these deformities. The mechanical cause of functional hallux limitus is essentially a blocking of windless function at the first metatarsal phalangeal joint, meaning a lack of ability of the first of the great toe to dorsiflex. And this tends to this will occur when the first ray is not allowed to plantar flex. If the first ray can't plantar flex, the hallux is not able to dorsiflex. And then when reactive forces are placed under the hallux, that will just increase compression within the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. Rukas in 96 looked at what happened if you applied force under the first metatarsal head and prevented the first ray from plantar flexing. And he found that rea ground reactive forces against the first MPJ prevent the first ray from plantar flexing, first of all, and that that will limit hallux dorsiflexion in essentially 100% of patients. So he did a very simple test here where he placed a piece of Corex, basically a, a Morton's extension under the first metatarsal head that prevented the first ray from plantar flexing. And again, 100% of patients had decreased ability to dorsiflex at the first MPJ. The second part of this study led, looked at what happened if you applied a reverse Morton's extension. You put a piece of Corex under med heads two, three, four, and five, and then let the first ray plantar flex. Well, in those patients, essentially 100% had increased ability to dorsiflex at the first MPJ. So now we want to look at what foot types will lead to these forces. What foot types lead to elevation of the first ray or prevent that first ray from plantar flexing? And there's a, there are three. Number one is the everted heel. So this rectangle represents the calcaneus. And as the calcaneus everts, it jams the medial forefoot into the ground. And that gr those ground reactive forces either elevate the first ray or at least prevent it from plantar flexing. The second foot type is this one here. This would be a forefoot valgus, where we have the first ray closer to the ground, or the first med head closer to, to the ground than the fifth med head. Uh, so again, ground reactive forces hit the first metatarsal head earlier in the gait cycle, and they elevate it or prevent it from plantar flexing, leading to functional hallux limitus. And then third is a very similar type uh, to that forefoot valgus. Uh, this is the plantar flex first ray. And again, that first metatarsal head is closer to the ground, and and thus uh, contacts the ground earlier in the gait cycle, leading to, to ground reactive forces applying uh, force, preventing that first ray from plantar flexing. Herodin and Bevan, in a study in 2000, looked at what happened if they used wedges to to evert the calcaneus. And what they were looking at is what happened to motion at the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. So in their subjects, those that had no wedge applied had an average of 85 degrees, approximately 85 degrees of hallux dorsiflexion available. Those where a three degree wedge was applied to evert the heel, and again, that's going to evert the heel and force the medial forefoot into the ground. And then we get those ground reactive forces elevating that first ray or preventing it from plantar flexing. So when you, they used a three degree wedge, they, they decreased the amount of dorsiflexion available at the first MPJ to an average of about 68 degrees. And with a five degree wedge, decreased to about 58 degrees. Shear in 2006 did a two-part study looking at the influence of functional foot orthoses on the range of motion in stance and in gait of the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. 
And again, this is where it was defined as functional hallux limitus as being greater than 50 degrees of dorsiflexion, non-weight bearing, and less than 14 degrees of dorsiflexion in stance. Patients were all casted with a first ray plantar flexed, and they, they all received a custom functional orthosis that was made with minimum cast fill, a 14 millimeter heel cup, two millimeter medial heel skive, a wide width, and a reverse Morton's extension. So in the first part of the study, which was the stance portion, uh, hallux dorsiflexion was measured in stance with and without the orthosis. And then the second part of the study was done in gait. Now, we, in gait, because the amount of hallux dorsiflexion was not able to be measured inside the shoe, instead they looked at the amount of pressure under the first, under the hallux. And what, they fa what was noted is that in the situation of ha functional hallux limitus, where there is limited range of motion of the first MPJ, there is increased pressure under the hallux. And if you have full motion of the first MPJ, or you have easier motion of the first MPJ and a greater range of motion, then you're going to have less pressure under the hallux. So hallux, subhallux pressure was measured during gait. In study number one, they found that, um, and again, this is the gate, or this is the stance portion, that when these patients were placed on orthotic devices, hallux dorsiflexion increased a mean of 90%. And in portion two, study two, which was the gate portion, uh, subhallux pressure was measured, and when orthoses were used, subhallux pressure decreased a mean of 14.8% both indicating that the use of the orthoses improved the amount of dorsiflexion available at the first MPJ. So now let's take these studies and apply those to orthotic prescriptions. So first, we want to try and allow that first rate of plantar flex, as both Rukas and Shear showed us. Um, so in doing so, we want to bring the first ray down when we cast. We want to plantar flex it during casting. We want to the orthosis to maintain close maintain close contour with the arch of the foot in order to let that first ray plantar flex. And we probably want to think about using a reverse Morton's extension on our orthotic devices. And then as Herodin showed us, we want to reduce e rear foot eversion. We can do so by using a deeper heel cup, increased width of the orthosis, and a medial heel skive. So let's look at each of these. First of all, casting technique is absolutely critical in this pathology. We want to make sure that first ray is plantar flexed along with having the foot and subtalar neutral and mid-tarsal joint locked. So here, these both of these feet, this is the same foot are in a position with the subtalar neutral and the mid-tarsal joint locked. But in the picture on the right here, we've applied a slight force to the first ray to plantar flex it. And you can see that that first ray is plantar flexed here relative to here. And if you can imagine then, making an orthosis off of this cast is going to allow that first ray to plantar flex more effectively and help decompress the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. You can accomplish this a couple different ways. You can either dorsiflex the hallux when you cast, you can plantar flex the first, or as we see in this picture, you can do both at the same time. And this is critical whether or not you are using plaster to get an image of the foot or whether you're using a digital scan of the foot. Either way, they must be non-weight bearing. If they are weight bearing in any way, that's going to elevate the first ray. Uh, and you must position the foot the same regardless of the, the, the imaging technique that you are using. So now let's look at what happens if you don't plantar flex the first ray when you're casting. Well, first of all, obviously we're going to capture that excessive varus within the negative cast. And then that is going to be captured in the positive cast. And finally, that's going to be captured in the orthosis itself. And now you have an orthosis that may not but it may not decompress the first metatarsal phalangeal joint as well as it should. And also, if enough varus is captured in there, it could actually elevate the first ray and cause a functional hallux limitus. So you have to be very careful in your casting technique in order to get an orthosis that is going to do what you want it to do in decompressing that first metatarsal phalangeal joint. So look at some x-rays of a foot with no orthosis, with an orthosis made from a cast where the first ray was not plantar flexed, and then with uh, orthosis from a cast where the first ray was plantar flexed. So here is the uh, first ray declination angle with no orthosis. And you see when we apply a uh, orthosis under here, we put the patient on orthosis where the orthosis was made from a cast where the first wave was not plantar flexed. There's not much change in the amount of uh, first ray declination. 
But when we put them on an orthosis that's made from a cast with the first ray plantar flex, we do have an increase in the first ray declination, which again is going to help decompress the first metatarsal phalangeal joint and improve dorsiflexion at, the, at that joint. So let's look at the orthoses themselves. Uh, first of all, we have to have a material that is rigid enough to resist deformation. If it flattens under the foot, if it deforms under the foot, then the foot's going to flatten and that's going to elevate the first ray. So we want at least a semi-rigid material. Polypropylene works well as we see here, but there are other materials that will do the same thing. Next we'll look at orthotic size. Um, and heel cup depth is critical in this in this. Uh, condition in that if the if the heel is rectus and stance, you can go with a standard depth heel cup. But if the heel is everted, we want to decrease eversion of the heel. Then we have to have orthotic surface area applying force to that area in order to stop that heel from everting. So we want the orthosis to be deep enough to apply force on the medial aspect of the heel. Um, so we're going to use a deep heel cup if the heel is everted. And for the same reason, we will use a wider width device. By definition, a wide device is the width of the entire foot, where a uh, standard width device is about a uh, is about an a eighth of an inch narrower than that. Keep in mind that if the device is a little bit too wide, you can always make it narrower. But if it's too narrow, you cannot make it any wider. So I was always err on the side of too wide in this situation. Next thing we're going to look be, be looking into the cast work that we're going to do on the positive cast. And the first thing we're going to recommend is the use of a medial heel skive. So the medial skive is simply a varus wedge that's added into the interior of the heel cup. This diagram here represents the calcaneus here. Here's the representation of the subtalar joint axis. Here's the uh, tibia and the talus up here. And by placing a varus wedge under the heel, you're going to shift the center of force farther medial to the axis of the subtalar joint. Uh, this was described in Kirby uh, in two articles, one uh, on the rotational equilibrium around the subtalar joint axis, and the second one listed here is the medial heel skive technique from Japman 1992. Um, and so if you want to add a varus wedge like this to an orthosis so that the center of force being applied by the orthosis to the foot is again farther medial to the axis of the subtalar joint, which is going to apply a greater supinatory torque around that axis and help limit excessive pronation then you can use the medial heel skive technique. This is a modification to the positive cast that creates a varus wedge on the interior of the heel cup. You can see this flattened area is the wedge on the interior of this heel cup on the medial side where it's more rounded laterally. Now the medial skive is, is prescribed in millimeters of depth. That's millimeters of depth on the positive cast. A mildly everted heel, let's say it's everted one to four degrees, you can use a mild amount of uh, medial skive, say two millimeters. If it's moderately everted, the heel is moderately everted in stance, five, six, seven, eight degrees, then you can use a four millimeter skive. And if it's severely everted, greater than eight degrees, I would recommend using a six millimeter skive. Now to go back one slide, the greater the amount of wedging, the deeper the heel cup should be. And you can find more information on exactly how deep that should be on our website. Second, uh, the next thing we're going to look at is how tight should the orthosis conform to the arch of the foot. And in order to let this first ray plantar flex, we really want to support that foot well under the talonavicular joint, right? So if you look at this orthosis here, that foot is flattened out to reach the orthosis, and that's going to elevate that first ray. Where here we've just put a block underneath to represent what would happen with a higher arch device, one that conforms closer to the arch of the foot when that first ray is plantar flex. Flex, and that you'll you'll see here that that first ray is allowed to plantar flex at a greater angle. So we have a greater uh, first ray declination angle here, and again, that's going to help decompress the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. How can you do that? Well, number one, you want to prescribe a minimum cast fill. Here we have some old plaster cast. We can see this first one here. There's quite a bit of white in here, indicating a lot of plaster added to the arch. That's going to make for an orthosis that gaps quite a bit from the arch. That's going to let the foot flatten, and that's going to elevate the first ray. Where this one at the far back, there's very little plaster added to the arch. That would be a minimum fill device, and that's going to conform closer to the arch of the foot. So we would recommend a minimum fill and really 
really ensure that your lab does not overfill the medial arch. Uh, there are a number of labs that will overfill the medial arch because it does make for a lower arched orthosis, and, and that means there's probably a little less potential patients may uh, feel the arch and, and, and have to have a slight adjustment made to the orthosis. But the closer you can conform to the arch, the more effective the device is going to be at helping to decompress the first metatarsal phalangeal joint and eliminating hallux limitus symptoms. Uh, the other thing that you can do in order to elevate the arch is to prescribe that the positive cast be inverted. Here we can see that the positive cast is inverted and that it is thicker under the first metatarsal head than under the fifth metatarsal head, allowing that arch to drop down farther. And again, that is going to increase the arch uh, and let that first ray plantar flex more effectively. Finally, we can add a reverse Morton's extension to the orthosis. That's going to, again going to let the first ray plantar flex. So this would be a good prescription for a patient with hallux limitus. We're going to cast with the first ray plantar flexed along with being in subtalar joint neutral and the midtarsal joint locked. We'll use a semi-rigid polypropylene, a wide width, the heel cup height is going to be dependent on how everted the heel is in stance, but we'll go with a minimum standard and possibly a deep heel cup, depending on how everted the, uh, the heel is. We will use a medial heel sky. Again, the amount of sky will depend on how everted the heel is in stance, but four millimeters is, uh, uh, is, a, is a good amount of medial sky for the average patient with a moderately everted heel. Uh, in addition, we'll invert the, ca the positive cast two degrees to increase the arch height a little bit and, and again, let that first rate plantar flex more effectively. We'll add a rear foot post to stabilize the orthosis in the shoe. Uh, we can put a uh, cover to the toes. We'll use EVA here, but almost any cover material will do. But we have that cover on there so that we can add the reverse Morton's extension to the orthosis. So the take home on this is that, number one, the casting technique is absolutely critical. You want to plantar flex the first ray when you are casting. Uh, you want to make sure the positive cast work is done so that the orthosis conforms close to the arch of the foot. You want to prescribe the device to prevent rear foot eversion and also prescribe to decrease force under the first metatarsal head. You can find more information at prolaborthotics.com. You can also email us at customer service, actually see us at prolab-usa.com or call us at that number listed. Uh, but if you go to the website, there's a tremendous amount of information, including other videos on other pathologies on uh, how to best write orthotic prescriptions. So thanks for listening. If you uh, would like to contact us, uh, here's how to do it.